My name is Ashley, and this is Let's Talk Dispatch. I do. <laughs> You're gonna do it. Do it really well. And I believe the world needs more dispatchers. In the mud, blood, beer. Years that I'm not working Fourth of July. Fourth of July. <laughs> hey, community I know is- right? What about community mm-hmm. dispatch? So on this show, with the help of my guests, we will educate, empower, and support the heroes behind the headset. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode here at Let's Talk Dispatch with me, Ashley, the Raspy Dispatcher. I'm very excited for this episode. If you listen to our podcast, you should know that I love technology technology advancing and how it affects the world of dispatching, specifically for me as a dispatcher, um, but the world of first responders in general, learning about the tech that's out there and the ability that tech has to affect us saving lives, really. Um, And today we're gonna be talking a lot about technology, specifically Central Square technology. Kevin Wattenbarger, my guest today, is the Director of Sales of 911 Call Handling at Central Square Technologies. They're going to come on and talk about history and experience in public safety, as well as being the director over at Central Square Technologies. They lead a team of 911 sales professionals to sell 911 call taking products in the United States and Canada. We know dispatches, we love Canada. <laughs> Kevin has over 25 years of experience in public safety and communication software. He has had many high-level positions with companies such as Motorola, Hexagon, Entrato, Carbine, and even Central Square Technology Zones, Perion. Kevin is also a former deputy sheriff in Wake County, North Carolina, and served in the U.S. Air Force in combat communications. My guest today, Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Hello, Ashley. How you doing? I'm doing wonderful. Hope you are. Yeah, I, you, we we were supposed to uh, record a week ago, but you got slammed with that yeah. weather there out on the East Coast. Yes, we got very bad, severe storms with tornadoes, damaging winds and rains. And when we were supposed to do this, I actually had a power outage. So the nice thing was, is we were prepared for that and were able mm-hmm. to shift the, the presentation and meeting. But uh, I hate we had to do that, but it would have been hard to do on battery backup. Oh, man. But, you know, as dispatchers, as first responders, we, we know how to pivot. You know, we know how to pivot. Absolutely. Absolutely. Got to have that backup plan. Awesome. Well, Kevin, tell us a little about, about yourself um, and how you got involved with Central Square Technologies. Yeah. So um, I've been in, on the vendor side for now uh, 25 plus years working with public safety um, solutions and, and software and technology to help public safety. Before I made that journey, um, I was a deputy sheriff, city police officer, and a telecommunicator. So my passion to get into the software and public safety software came from that. I, I wanted to get into the technology to help save lives, but I didn't want to leave the public sector. So this was a good mashup of the two together for me to be able to do both things that I love. Previous to getting into public safety, I was in the military and I did combat communications, which is eerily similar to what we do in in the telecommunicator world and how our technology has worked for the last 20, 25 years. Um, The military has advanced and now we're starting to see those same advancements on the public sector side on, on technology and how our local and state governments use that. Yeah, it's even in the last five years, you know, me doing this job, you know, from baby dispatcher to, I'd say, teenager, um, technology has grown so much. I mean, just in these five years alone, let alone 25 years of experience, you know, in this in this field. Um, what kind of technology is Central Square bringing to the table to help our first responders? Well, that's, that's you know, a, a good point, actually, because, you know, if I look back when I was first in public safety and I got my first call as a deputy sheriff, it was a plane crash. And of all things, you never know what that first call is going to be. And we didn't have computers. We didn't have cell phones. Right. And so everything has evolved and we're part of that evolution. Now you have computer aided dispatch, which, you know, we're a big part of 
We also have mobile computers now that you can have digital dispatch components. Then you have mobile field reporting, jail management systems. And then on the front end of that is the now one telephony that answers that now one call, um, thinking of that plane crash and how that could have evolved today compared to where we were back then. I'm not going to tell my age totally here when that was, but you can kind of figure it out before we did had laptops and cell phones. But, you know, that's what we do here at Central Square. We have technologies that are industry leading and we serve over 8,000 organizations that impact three out of four citizens across North America. So to, for us, this is our passion. This is what we do. We're one of the largest public safety um, solutions companies that are in the market today. That's amazing. And I mean, okay, first let's pause and talk about your first dispatch call. <laughs> What's a plane crash? Like yeah. we tell people all the time, you never know what kind of call is going to drop right. in your ear. Um, and I think oftentimes to like plane crash, people falling out the sky, like when does that happen? It happens. It does it, it, happen quite does. frequently, unfortunately. <laughs> and, and this was while I was still in rookie school as, as a deputy. So I was going to be a, you know, a field deputy and um, what, we had our own rookie school. And so um, whenever they need more personnel, we're sworn deputies from the get go. So we can carry a gun. We have full arrest powers until you get, you know, certified from their BLET, you could still do full arrest powers of being part of the sheriff's office. So we were in rookie school, got the call. It, it happened and time is a blur because it's been so long ago. But I think we got the call at 5 and 6 p.m. It was um, about 34 degrees and raining. So you can kind of assimilate what really happened in the upper upper areas of what, what happened. And it actually came back, I think, to be pilot era, but uh, it was probably a couple miles from the airport and crashed in a wooded area. So they called us to go out and help perform security of the area because we had people that were trying to get on the scene, take pictures. And I was on the USA Today. I mean, it was crazy because all my you know fellow co-workers gave me a hard time about that, called me Hollywood and all that kind of growing up. But it, 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 it really kind of makes you think about what things can happen. And that was a bad event. And a lot of things had to come into control there. We had to set up a command and control bus, um, had to, you know, get all kinds of response agencies in. And that was my chance to kind of learn that on the fly of seeing what was happening. So uh, pretty, pretty neat event. I got a full respect of the National um, Traffic and Safety Board, NTSB, of what they do and how they respond to a scene and label all the parts and pretty interesting. But I, I tell people, and, and you know, we did what we did then, but our response could have been better by having the technologies that are available today. And, and when I tell people it's not the end all be all, but if you can save seconds, those seconds saves lives. I tell people there's a whole continuum on changing the outcome of a serious injury and it's called the golden hour. So if you can reduce seconds off of that golden hour, you could possibly change the outcome of that severe um, type of incident and the injuries that are that occur from it so that's what where my passion comes from every day everything that i get up and do and and we're out here talking about technology it's not just because we sell it it's because i believe in it and i, I have a part in bringing that technology to the marketplace um, and making sure we're evolving here as a company to keep adding those and it's a tough conversation as you're going to see today there's there's points in it where people you know may not want it or I do want it. And, and I tell people is, you know, it's not about um, who's right and who's wrong. We need to be in the conversation talking about it so we can evolve that technology, create policies, create governance around when you would use it, when you wouldn't use it. So that way, you know, I, I think about my loved ones. I want us to be using that technology so we can have outcomes that would be safer for them and could save lives you know, in the end. Yeah. And I think what's so interesting about, you know, folks who are in the field going into technology companies like Central Square Technologies is that you do have that real life memories and experiences with these calls. When you think about like this plane crash call and you think about the technology that's available through Central Square Technology now, you're like, man, that this tech would have really helped me in this moment. And Absolutely. I know we talk, yeah, how technology saves lives, but it also 
prevents trauma for our first responders, right? Because if we can get, yeah, if we can get that save, if we can prevent that loss, you know, we're not, we're not adding to, to our backpacks either. So absolutely, absolutely. Well said. Yeah. And so one of the big things that um, when you folks reached out wanting to talk about is in regards to the video starting to become more of a, a uh, tool for us in our dispatch centers, video relay, um, being able to see what our callers seeing or, you know, how, so how does that technology um, come into play in Central Square? Yeah, I think that's a, it's a good starting point because there's a lot of, you know, misconceptions and thoughts about video and what that, what that means. And first, I always like to tell people it's not a requirement and the video is not two way. The caller is not going to see the telecommunicator behind the headset. We're not going to be on FaceTime. We're not going to be. It's not going to be like me and you today, right? It's only a one way. And and, and to be honest, it's a opt-in type of of a a request because that video is not coming in as the 911 call. We're basically Mm -hmm. sending an outbound request to the caller saying, hey, uh, and and they're still talking to the telecommunicator and saying, hey, look, we have a new tool. I want to see what you're seeing. I'm going to send you a request to your phone. You need to basically accept us to be able to see what you're seeing. I'm going to want to get access to your microphone and your camera. And we have the ability to change front or back once we have that access in case they don't want to rotate their phone. Because my mother's bad about that. She'll be FaceTiming. <laughs> I never see, <laughs> see, you see her me? or whatever. Yeah. And she don't know how to rotate the camera. So our technology allows us to do that. But by law, we have to ask that, right? Because it's not a granted right like it would be somebody calling 911 and we can get their location. So what happens with the technology, first of all, is we communicate directly with the device when they say yes, we get enhanced location now from the device instead of the triangulation that happens with the towers. So we're getting it from the GPS on the device. Um, Another thing that we get now is in the camera. So now we're seeing what that person's seeing. Um, this is big because and you probably know this in your training, being trained and or training somebody. It's hard to be able to ask somebody, you know, what's happening there? You know, if it's a car fire, where's the car parked? Is it next to a building? And if we forget to ask one of those questions in our training or the caller is just so amped up, you can't get to that point. You may not know that that could change how we dispatch, right? And so just by us having the access of the video of seeing what that person's seeing, now Mm -hmm. that changes the game of, okay, now maybe I'm dispatching a little bit differently because now that car is parked in a garage and now it's not a car fire anymore, it's a structure fire. And it gets a totally Mm -hmm. different response. It's not a single engine response anymore. It's a full complement response. And that wouldn't have been known if that person didn't tell you that until you got to the scene and the first responders got there and said, hey, the house now is engulfed. We need the rest of the compliment to come out. And guess mm-hmm. what? We just lost seconds, minutes, mm-hmm. a part of that golden hour to change that outcome. Yeah. You know, it's funny. We just had a, with the rains and stuff out here in, in the Bay, we had, you know, naturally car accidents and things like that come across more often. And we had a call where it was this kind of weird roadway that we have that if you don't know where you are, you don't know where you are. Cause it's like this tunnel almost like you're kind of in mm-hmm. between a sound wall and um, like vegetation. So if you don't know where you are, it's kind of hard to pinpoint Absolutely. your location. And we had multiple callers calling about the accident and they just kept saying, it's really bad. Like, it's really bad. And you're just like, well, what does that mean? (laughs) You know, like, it's the the ultimate game of telephone you're playing as a dispatcher. And having visuals, I I get why some dispatchers are like, "Mm, I don't know about that. I don't want to see it. That's why I'm in in here and not out there. Sure. But having the option to look when your caller isn't really being able to be descriptive or they're having a hard time explaining what they're seeing. I would find that so helpful. Absolutely. And, and I'm the worst caller because of my experience. So I travel the country every week. And a lot of times when I'm driving, 
I don't know where I'm at because now we're using our apps, whether it's yeah. on Google Maps or yeah, Waze like or whatever. Yes. I, mm-hmm. I don't know where I'm at. And so I ran up on an, an accident. Same thing. I was on a call. I hung up and said, hey, I've got to call 911. Called 911. And I said, yes, I have a very bad uh, traffic accident. They said, where are you at? I said, I don't have a clue. Uh, I, I can tell you what I'm looking at. I, I had no clue. I was on a four um, lane div- uh, divided highway. Um, and I said, and I said exactly what you said. You got to get somebody out here now. It is bad. And they were like, well, sir, how, how do you know it's bad? And they didn't know all my training and first responder and being a deputy and, and sitting behind the headset. They had no clue, but I had a hard time telling them of why it was bad. And it was yeah. a tractor trailer versus a Honda Accord. So the Honda yeah. Accord pulled out in front of a tractor trailer and it T-boned the Honda Accord. And you mm-hmm. can imagine a, a full speed of what that is. And I was trying to tell them it's bad. And so if I would have able to have video, I didn't have to be in the car and showing injuries. I could have been mm-hmm. at a distance and just show them, look at the impact. And a first responder seeing that, they know now, hey, you, yeah. I know you're going to get air flight in route now because look at, they had airbags deployed, the crumple zone was so far in the driver's seat. Um, they would know these different things and, and, you know, change their dispatch. But maybe I send a truck out there now that has the jaws of life in it instead of, you know, this was a rural fire department. So they may not come out with there with the right equipment and they don't know until the incident commander gets on there and they're just using, you know, desperate minutes in that golden hour. Yeah, totally. And I mean, and it's so interesting like how each situation can really be impacted by our technology by our lack of knowledge about what's going on i mean you know we have it all the time where you're talking to a caller and the example i always give is like there's blood everywhere and you're like (laughs) your officer is like there's blood everywhere it's on the walls it's on the you know floor like this is what they're telling me and they get there and there's like a speck like, yep. it's like, yep. like, no, like it was paint. It wasn't even blood. Like, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Awesome. And I think that that's what we're up against, Ashley, with video. Our first kind of reservation is the worst. And then when people use it, then they start seeing, well, you know what? It's not as bad as what we were thinking. I used the correlation. Remember how we all thought text to 911 was going to be when we implemented it and how much it was going to overrun our centers? And now we look at it, how many calls actually come in that way? Very few. And then when they do, though, it's usually ones that you need to to follow up on. So Mm -hmm. I think you'll see this, you know, once it starts getting adopted across the country, people work out how they're going to do it, what technology Mm -hmm. they're going to use to do it. Um, You're going to see that that perception is going to change because a lot of people's eyes, that perception is reality. But we got to change that perception because it's not really what you want to think. Same thing for me of that plane crash. I was worried about what I was going to see before I got there. And so my mind was working up. But when I got there, it was totally different. And so that perception has now changed because the new reality is what I saw. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so text 911, one of the things that um, happens with text 911 is, you know, our citizens have free reign to send stuff to text to 911. I've gotten many a mixtape sent to me via (laughs) text to 911. And you respond back, they're like, that was accidental. I'm like, was it? Like, do you accidentally send (laughs) this? But is that our, can citizens send unsolicited videos to 911, maybe through that tech, that link they're sent after the call or, having access in a in that type of way? Very good question. So it has to be a center initiated request. So the Nolan Center has to put that request out to the citizens. And once that session is done, it's a completed session that they can't send back anything back. They can call again and, and then request another session and, and they can get back connected. But the, the citizen cannot request that, get that reestablished. And part of that is so we follow the laws that are in place today and the protections that are there because it was them calling 911. And that's why we ask permission, but they only grant that permission for when we're on with them at that point. So once we close that session down, then at that point, the session is closed. They can't reinitiate. That's good. I'm sure that would, knowing that probably eases 
the dispatcher's minds a little bit, knowing that yeah. you know this this interaction is you know up to me, not up to up to you. So exactly, um, and and that's a perfect point too, because you're probably will not be using video for every call. It's mm -hmm. only if, and your policies dictate this as well, but only if you can change the dispatch. Um, outcome or or how you what you would dispatch right mm -hmm. so obviously if somebody calls me and said hey I'm calling to report a gas drive off that happened two days ago video is not going to help me there so I'm going to initiate it but if they mm -hmm. called me right now and said hey look um, I see somebody um, they're pulling off I've got a video of their their tag and sure because it's happening there and then you might be able to give a suspect description rate of travel, which direction they're going. So only certain rules will apply. And there'll be some, like somebody calls in and reporting a suicide, that's not gonna be one that you're gonna to want to do a video on. There's just yeah. no need in that, because at that point, you're not gonna change what you dispatch. So, mm -hmm. you know, we'll let the people come in and get on site and do the evidentiary things they need to do, but it won't change the, the, the outcome. So. A lot of that has to be up front. And that's part of this discussion now because most people you talk to, Ashley, they don't have um, SOPs or guidelines on how to do this because it's new. And so all this is being created now. But as I've seen, people are creating these, are able to share it with other agencies. I'm also seeing that unintended uses are coming out of it that they never mm -hmm. thought of, right? Not just mm -hmm. changing the outcome of what you would dispatch, but how you can save somebody's lives. And I think one thing that um, would come up if I was the dispatcher asking the citizen to allow me this access is how are how is Central Square technology protecting that citizen's data and their privacy once they give us that access? Because I could I could see a citizen being like, I don't want, I don't want the police in my phone, <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> Like what, you know, so what is that? Yeah, How can that's you a, explain that? Yeah, so it really, um, we have no access to the data that's on the phone other than when the person called 911 and we had their registered 10 digit phone number and we get the alley. And then when we request the location and video, all we get is device location. And that's it. And then we have an open IP socket that we're talking back and forth for the video channel only. So we're not enabled to go get other things off the phone. Mm. You know, data privacy restricts that. So we can only do what we've intended to do in putting out that request. And that's why we do what we do. But whenever you say yes, that establishes that connection to make that happen. Okay, good. Because uh, I can imagine that being really reassuring yeah. if you have, you know, a caller is like, oh, no, um, you know, having that knowledge as a dispatcher to, to, get them to work with you um, right. would be extremely helpful. A good and way I think, to compare that to is like FaceTime. If mm -hmm. I reach out to you and hit FaceTime, I can't connect unless you say yes. But when I do, all I have access is that video and audio that's happening in that dialogue. That's it. I have mm -hmm. no other open channel on the phone or device. So it's very similar to that. Ours is a little bit more secure than what, what FaceTime would be because of uh, we got to compress it and secure it and send it back over. Uh, into the 9-1 network. So we got to make sure that the, the security protocols are followed. But um, it's very kind of simplistic way to look at it, but it's similar to, to how you would look at it based time. Awesome. And I know we talked a little bit about some examples, but do you have any other examples where this technology may be Absolutely. Useful? So we have one of our customers that's been using, um, um, actually, and, and when I talk about this, I'm not talking about what we offer. I'm talking about video a, a, as a whole. They're actually using a, a different product than, than ours before we developed and got it out there. But what they learned in this was that they were watching people give CPR instructions and they were watching CPR, they were doing it wrong. And so they were able to come back and evaluate and change how they give CPR instructions to have a better outcome. Because you know when you're giving CPR, that's a life or death moment. And if you're not doing it right, you're not gonna save that life. So unintended consequence for them seeing video of somebody doing CPR that they need to modify how they were doing it and how they were instructing CPR. And it might have been even their first responders, right? That were part of this continuum. So that was one example. There was another one that uh, we were privy to that 
uh, somebody called 911 and said they, they lived in an area with a lot of water is there, like a lot of waterways, kind of like you're in the bay. And that's kind of an intercoastal environment. And they had fell into the water. They called 911 and said, I need somebody to come rescue me. Well, whenever they sent them the link and found out the person was on the edge, standing on a rock in the water, he just couldn't get out. He needed help because it was a huge barrier to get over the wall to get out. And mm. but if you know how we are telecommunicators and first responders, they send everybody and their brother out. They're going to start doing a grid <laughs> search to find this person because, you know, it plotted him way in the water, which he really wasn't until we got the devices really true location. And then when we saw the video and saw where they were standing, they called off all the resources except for that one engine or the, the rescue squad that was going. And all they had to do is go down there and give them a rope, pull them up, and they were good. So yeah, that's an yeah. example. The water, I'm thinking you're, you're yeah. doggy paddling. I don't even it, know how you got this phone call off. It, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But we kind of go worst case in our head. And so we're calling out everybody, but this is a, a, an example of how you could save those resources to save somebody else's lives. Could you imagine how many resources they would have sent out there and they were able to counsel them off so they could go to other things. So um, I see things like that come up all the time of, of how they would do things. We had another where it was coming on an interstate road system and um, something flew up from the roadway and impaled the car. Um, what, which you don't want to see the video of that, but what they were able to use with that technology is to get the person's true device location mm -hmm. instead of triangulation to know on an interstate freeway which side it's on. Because as you know, um, it may be a mile or two down the road for an exit for them to get back on and be able to respond. Mm -hmm. So I've seen many, many times that um, it, it, the unintended result actually has helped and they're like, wow, we didn't think of that. And that's what happens with new te technology as it's evolving that you say, well, you know what? I didn't think of that, but that's something else we can use this for. And the whole thing here is, is we want to save lives. We want the technology if it's not doing that, then we need to back off and maybe not use it and, yeah. and you know, have the right SOPs that kind of um, guide us to that, that way. Yeah. And I, I actually thinking of a call that I had when I was first starting, it was like a house party um, that ended in a shooting. And I, my caller was like fleeing, you know, they're in the car, mm -hmm. they're all, you know, heading out, leaving. And they're trying to give me this info and they didn't know where they were. And they were kind of on this like border of uh, between jurisdictions. And I was like, you gotta give me something. And just, I just thought like having access, like the way you're saying that the technology you folks have is allowing that access, we could have pinpointed a little better because it was like before the rapid SOSs and deploys kind yeah. of started coming through, like it was a little pre that technology. Yeah. So I was like, I remember him saying, you don't know where I am. I'm like, no, <laughs> <laughs> I promise you if I knew well, that we would, I wouldn't keep asking. <laughs> yeah, they're like, are you sure? Cause I've seen TV shows and we, they know yeah. everywhere, right? <laughs> it's that perception oh goodness, again. Just lie. They're liars. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that we've seen is you think about an officer chase on foot and you're relying on their location, what they call out on the radio, which I know how I am when I do that and I run and I'm out of breath and I'm trying to talk and I'm excited. Nobody can understand it. Right. So we've had people take that and actually before they start the chase, um, get them to say yes on their phone. And now where they just basically put their phone in their vest. And now we got real video of where they're going and, and we get real time updates. It's, it's a different thought process of, of how they use it. We've had some strap it to a canine and let the canine go right to see. Um, now, some of that you got to be careful, right? To make sure because, you know, if the canine catches what it's after, you got to be careful. You don't want to show all of that right to, to the person behind the headset. But the thing about it is, is getting that officer's location, because a lot of times when on that foot chase, you don't know where they're at until they get to where they're going and say, this is where I'm at. But if they're in a, a, a wooded area, they may not even know where they're at either to get back out. Because, yeah. you know, they imagine how long the chase goes. For me, yeah. it would be short. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, when my officers decide to go on a light jog, which is, you know, it is hard. I mean, think about, you know, it being able to run, put out traffic, turn, find where you are, uh, being able to know if you're going 
north, south, east, or west, you know, yep. while wheezing, it's, it's hard. So I, I love the idea of being able to see what my officer's seeing during those foot chases, just so I, I can have a better understanding of where they are. or if They don't know where they are. I can start plotting on the map. Like if when I see landmarks, I can kind of, you know, um, right. use my technology that I have inside of my center to find where they are before they know where they are. You know, and second saves lives, especially if um, our units are going to end up going hands on with the person, which if they catch them, <laughs> yep. they are. I mean, they're running there. It's going right. to be a hands on situation. So you want to get everyone where they need to go as quickly as possible. Experience a revolution in public sector efficiency with Central Square Technologies. Their customized software for government agencies and cutting edge advancements in public safety redefine streamlined operations and data driven insights. Imagine equipping first responders with state of the art tools for faster, more effective emergency responses. A game changer. As a dispatcher myself, who we'll understands seconds saves lives. Central Square serves over 8,000 public sector agencies. The best run communities rely on Central Square. So I think one thing that I've always heard dispatchers talk about, especially like um, folks who have been doing it a while at my original center, when the the idea of video technology um, coming into our centers was starting to kind of go through the rumor mill that this was going to be a thing and and whatnot, is the folks who, the dispatchers seeing the thing that they normally are only hearing. Right. Um, you know, so how does viewing these videos in sensitive situation adversely affect our dispatchers and their mental health and their self right. care? I, I think that some of this we're we're going to have to kind of wait and find out, right? Because we're still on the front edge. But what I can tell you, where people have implemented, it is not the perception that they thought it wasn't a reality, and we're actually seeing it traverse into now they have closure compared to what they would have had at the beginning because most of the time you know what what they called but you don't know how it ended up perfect example you gave at the beginning blood was everywhere and obviously it really wasn't right or you know that the people got there and and was able to respond in a manner um, and people were safe so what we're seeing is is it changes that perception so people have closure and having that closure or when you have lack of closure your brain does a lot of weird things it starts mm -hmm. making and connecting those dots for you and it really may not need to get connected um, i still think there's a lot with this that we've got to dictate with policies and guidelines of when you use that because i think if we do that you can control the effects on it and then maybe you even have guidelines on maybe at first make it available for who wants to do it. And then what you will see is we saw agencies do that before. We had people waiting in line to be able to do it later because they had FOMO, right? They didn't want to miss out. <laughs> and so they, they all said, you know what? It made their jobs easier being able to see instead of just having to talk with an irate caller, I can make some judgments on based on what I'm seeing. I still think there's things that's going to have to catch up with it on legislation and protection, because what if something happens that something's on the screen and you're multitasking and doing something else and you miss it, right? Um, so all that still has to be vetted. But at the mm -hmm. end of the day, and what I always go back to is if we can save lives by having it, then we've got to have the protections and guidelines to, to make sure that if something happens and I'm doing four different screens and something happens on the screen that I can't be held responsible for something I didn't see because mm -hmm. the person is not telling me. So I think that's the aspects of we don't have all those answers yet, but I think mm -hmm. we will. I think about the other side to this is um, the evidentiary side, right? You, you ask a lot of mm -hmm. communication centers, they don't want it to be recorded to be in the evidence long term. You ask mm -hmm. the other side, law enforcement, absolutely they do because that helps them in doing um, you know, detective work on what happened and they need it to be part of the evidentiary chain because, you know, like it or not, as telecommunicators, we're part of that chain and yeah. we get subpoenaed and have to go testify mm -hmm. and it's all part of it. 
but if yeah. we have the right protections and you know we 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 should be okay with that right but that's the things that's got to catch up and i think that while we have to be having talks like this we've got to be having talks with our legislators we got to have policies uh, the agency needs to talk with its attorneys and how they want to handle it because i will do believe that it's going to be an access issue eventually that mm -hmm. we're not going to be afforded on whether you could have it or not, because what ended up happening, it'll turn the other way that people could get sued for not having it. And it could have saved a life. It could have shortened the response time. So I think all that, none of it's right, wrong or different because every agency is looking at it differently across the country, but we've got to be looking into it. We've got to be talking about it so we can come to, you know, where we're at today in text the now once because we had all these conversations and we implemented, look where we're at. And everything's evolving as next gen now one keeps moving in that continuum. We got to kind of, as a group, talk about it, get out there, talk about the concerns and see if they're really concerned. And then if they are, let's address them, right? If we do yeah. see that it adds to, you know, more mental health, then what's available to be able to address that? I, I love what our industry is doing right now on the mental health side and the, and the, the opportunities that is presenting itself and, and they're doing a lot of wellness things for our community. And I love that because I think we need to do that. Some will be affected by it, some others will not. And we got to kind of figure that out. So I think it's evolving actually of, of how that is. But on the front side, we're seeing that it's actually helping instead of hurting. Yeah, I do like the idea of um, it's creating closure for the dispatcher because you're right. A lot of times, like not here in the end of the call, sure, but when you the call you do have access to, you're kind of creating the story in your head, you're creating the yeah. visual in your head, and like our blood example. And it's like in my head, like that room is full of blood. I never seen it not full of blood, it's a room full of blood. So exactly. if I, yeah, so if I get that visual access to the thing with you know everyone's consent involved, then. I do have this opportunity to my brain clicks what, you know, actually occurred rather than it drawing a picture. And I'm not a great artist, but you know, <laughs> our brains, they, they do amazing things with the stuff we're hearing, you know? And, they do. and I think with the policies and guidelines that helps us to cut mm -hmm. down on the mental health, because if you got the right policies and guidelines of when you use it based on the call that you're on, then that helps reduce what can be seen. And then the technology lets you take control of that. Let's say that um, they begin to show you something that you don't wanna see. You can actually cut the video off without disconnecting the caller. Still recording and doing what it needs to do in the back end, but now we reduce that mental health aspect from that caller because now based on their guidelines, our guideline says that that's not something they're supposed to see and they can turn that video off, but it's still recording and, and handling it appropriately. Yeah. And when you think about it, like you said, for the evidence factor, you know, like dispatchers were taught that the questions we're asking, we're asking them because it's evidence. This is a recorded line. This is before the officers arrive on scene, before the person maybe have changed their mind about what they want to report. Right. Um, and like we've had, I know I've had call and I'm sure every dispatcher has had a call where you're hearing a DV situation or a physical assault and you hear it and you're like, this is a full out fight brawl. Like they're actively fighting. I'm listening to this. Yes. And then they get the officers get on scene and they clear it as like no physical. And you're like, <laughs> what in the world? Like come this to this tape. What's <laughs> happening? Like, I know this is physical. I heard it, you know? Um, so having that and, and again, assuming the person on the phone is going to allow you the access to it, but having that visual recording of the scene being a physical altercation for that example um, does provide that extra step of evidence to help victims when they're not ready to help themselves, you know? That's right. You're right. As that story has changed, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how often it does. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really. you're right. It's kind of that telephone game though. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I have a youth group and I, I do a little exercise that we stand them in a circle and whisper in one person's ear and what happens every time by the time it gets to the end it's different and it's because yeah. the way we perceive things is different 
and that becomes that person's reality. They thought they heard this, and it's just because their brain is altered to change that. Well, our callers are no different than that. They're on a telephone, right? They're telling us how they're perceiving it, and it's totally different than sometimes the reality. Yeah, and I mean, and you can tell your youth group, they've already completed half the training of becoming a dispatcher. <laughs> that's right, that's right. You're exactly doing right. That, that exercise because it is true. And the the reality is, is that you have to believe your caller, right? Like no matter what, what they're saying, no matter if they sound, um, sound like they're lying, no matter if they sound like, you know, they're, they're just trying to get you there faster by the things they're saying, we have to believe them, their truth to be truth. Like yeah. if they say Billy has a gun, Billy has a gun until someone gets out yeah. there and proves Billy doesn't have a gun. And so yeah. these layers of technology that we're embedding into our systems helps to create more trust really between our caller and us. Um, because I now I see Billy has a gun, you know. That's right. You know, That's those, right. those types of situations can be um, harder to get to the truth. And if we have a visual in certain situations, I think it definitely helped. Yep, agreed. So, what other benefits does using uh, utilizing video bring into our centers, into our first responders? Uh, you know, I, I think on top of everything that we've been talking about today is just that it's a good fact check. And we, we were just talking about that a little bit. Um, you, you maybe have a hunch that this person is telling that truth, but now you get that visualization now of really what's happening. So you could check, adjust that emergency response. And I think that that's the key. You know, we I gave you a couple examples earlier where we downgraded a response instead of having to upgrade it. But we might have to do that, right? If that car fire, that, that person was reporting. Now we see us partly in the garage of a house. Now we're gonna upgrade that response and not have to do that minutes after people get on scene. So I think that's the biggest benefits of, of using video to be able to speed up the response. Cause you know, we're it, that based on Nina standards and AFCO standards, we're all judged on how quick we can take a call and how quick we can dispatch response then the responders are, are judged by a certain time of how long it takes them to get on the scene. And there's actually insurance standards for fire department, things like that, of how quick they can. And it causes our rates to go up as individuals based on how quick they can get there. But mm -hmm. just something this simple by using technology can affect that. Because yes, we can be fast on taking the call. Yes, we can do this. But if we had a different understanding, we could have sent the right people at the point of need at that time, it could have saved minutes or seconds or, I mean, many minutes in, in certain aspects. Where I live in rural, it may take them 10 minutes to get here. If they sit in the wrong thing, then guess what? It may take another 10 minutes. So that's the thing that I look at that um, that it really could change. And I think sometimes we got to get away from the, the scary part of it and look at this is the outcomes. And this is the true outcome. I don't want to see the injury. I don't want to see the bad stuff. I want to see something that I can make that quick decisions that I can say, okay, I need to upgrade this response or downgrade it or keep it on par so I can monitor what's happening and see if we need to send more. Yeah. And I think that the, the examples that you've been giving are amazing. And they, especially I think when it comes to like medical and like you said, fire structure things, um, but really a I really do think about technology, um, this technology being super helpful for the medical dispatcher because, you know, I do police Absolutely. only. And the one thing that I always say on here is like, I don't know if I could do the fire, fire medical side because you're trying to get someone to do the thing, you know, on their loved one correctly, mm -hmm. exactly. you know, miss their... And that's tough. Yeah, I miss their they're going through it. And mm -hmm. if you can visually see, you know, I know we've all if you're in this field, you're probably a true crimer and you're listening to calls where like I was telling them to do CPR and then they weren't doing it. And you're just like, what? <laughs> What's yeah. happening? You know, so having visuals on these, especially medical scenes, I think I even heard a story where they used the video calling and could see the patient's lips 
yeah, and the color of their lips help them determine what type of step to take to help the person who was on scene help before the medics arrive. So, you know, yeah, I totally think, agree. yeah, I think all of these different calls. And I think, like you said, we're going to learn as we go. And I think a lot of times we can um, be a little nervous about yeah. that reality is that we are implementing something new. 911 is new. You know, it's only what, 50 years old. It's, 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 it's a baby, you know? Yeah. So with our technology advancing, um, we're gonna have to create the policies for the technology that we're introducing into this field. Yes, we are. And where do you see technology going in the next 10 years? I mean, you've been doing this for 25 plus years. You've seen it go from like, what is technology to, oh my gosh, we have computers to what we're doing now. Where do wow. you see it going in the next 10 years? It's it's crazy to see the evolution of, of where we've been in 25 years that I've been on the technology side. Um, and this next 10 years, I think it's going to be the pivotal part in how fast things are happening. Um, video is kind of that first part into this, but um, thinking about if somebody is texting your now one center, but they don't speak English, mm -hmm. right? You can't really transfer that to a language line. Wouldn't it be great to have translation where it translates from a different language? And not only just Spanish, what if it translated over a hundred different languages automatically and it could take that and translate it back to you in a way that you can communicate, but it records both. That's coming in the, in the very near future. Also, what about the need right now? You'll use language line if somebody's talking to you, not texting, um, having the ability that it also real time does a translation of the voice. And now you can hear and not need language line, right? So, which we all know that it's a valuable service, but it's just not easy to use sometimes. It's so. hit or miss, man. A good translator <laughs> goes a yep. long way. If you're listening to your translator yep. and you're a good one, ah, you're appreciated. That's right. <laughs> and, and so the technology is getting there that we'll be able to take, take advantage of that. Um, and it'll make, I think, our jobs quicker and again, being able to dispatch quicker by getting to find out what's happening. Um, it's, it's frustrating when you can't communicate to somebody and that's why we did text to 911 for the hard of hearing. Now we have to do the others with different different languages. So that's coming, um, you know, I'll give a little sneak peek, but that'll be out this year, right? In 2024, huge, huge things for us, but also transcribing of what's being taught. So think of closed caption for 911. That's actually in the marketplace today. Um, so uh, I see this evolving where, you know, not only having these videos in 911, but now we can send them to the first responders, right? Mm -hmm. And they have it in their mobiles. They have it in their command post to see what's happening in real time and making adjustments as they need. Not just having it in 911, put it down to the, the point of need and the, the first responders. So things are really moving been very, very fast and a lot of partners are working together. We're working with a lot of our partners to bring that technology. And we may decide that it may not be something we do, but somebody else does. And we partner together to bring that best experience to our customers and public safety. That's awesome. I think one good point you made in regards to our technology, like we've been talking about technology, um, specifically in this episode, helping our dispatchers, helping our folks in the field, um, but you're right when we're talking about using this technology to make 911 inclusive, you know, text 911 for the, you know, deaf or hard of hearing communities, folks who speak other languages, you know, there is a fear of calling into 911 because not being able to communicate in the language that they're comfortable in. Absolutely. So definitely using this technology. Well, that's the first thing yeah. I think of that when I go out of the country, I take a cruise and if I have to call 911, are they going to be able to understand what I'm saying? So I think yeah. about, you, you think about, we all kind of live, some people do in these, you know, travel meccas, you probably do there in the Bay Area, you have cruise ships. Think of everybody who works on the cruise ships. A lot of them are not from here. Something happens and they need to call 911. Their native language is not English, right? And so when they, happens when they're in an emergency situation, they fall back to their native language because they're excited, they're scared, they're emotional. And we need to be able to have a way other than, I mean, language line has worked, 
but we need to have other ways to make that faster and cut down that time. More options, the better, more options, the better. So where, where do folks find Central Square? How do they reach out to you folks to see the technology that you guys have? How do they link up with you guys? So one of the best places is check us out online um, on our we are on, on the social media platforms, whether it's uh, LinkedIn, um, Facebook, Twitter, obviously online on our website. Um, they can reach out to me and I can get them in contact if they need to get more information. Um, APCO and Nina have been big supporters of having the discussion and we do panel um, discussions at some of the local chapter level and at the national levels. Um, we do it at our customer engagement uh, conference, which we call Engage. Um, that is all about getting, getting involved with all of these and getting the information that's out there. So plenty of ways of kind of find out more. We, every one of my reps today, um, our account executives have the ability to demo the video stuff uh, on their personal, or, or excuse me, their office laptop, where they can actually go show you this. And it's not a mocked up version. This is what's out live today that we have in our production. So that's probably one of the best ways, Ashley, is just to kind of reach out to get more on the, our social footprint. And then there's a way you can contact us and we can reach back to you to get you more information. Awesome. And I'll include all those links and uh, socials in the description of this video. So don't feel like you got to rush to write it down or anything. Um, it'll all be there for you guys to easily access it. Um, Kevin, this has been a wonderful conversation. I've learned so much. Like I said in the beginning, I love technology and I love what it can do for our first responders who are showing up in person, our dispatchers, we're answering the phone as well as our citizens who are calling in. One of the questions that I ask everybody who comes onto my show is what advice would you give someone who's considering considering a career as a dispatcher or as a first responder in general? You know, that's, that's a great question. And, and um, when, when I got out of um, law enforcement side of public safety, I wanted to be technically challenged and then still make a difference. And when I started to say, you know what, what do I want to go do? I tried different things, be willing to try. And if it doesn't work, don't automatically escape that vertical, try something else within it because you, you will find a niche. And 25 years later, I'm still here on the technology side. I have found my niche and I still can make a difference. Um, but I tell you, you know, dispatch is our first first responder. So we thank you guys for what you do each and every day. Um, it makes me feel safe that I know that I am a call away to be able to get the help that I need. Um, and, you know, it's just a way that you could really connect and still make a difference without having to go put on the badge, without having to put on the headset, but you're still involving. I'm still working with the same people that I worked with when I was in the room. And so that to me scratches all those different itches I have that I can still be a part of it and then still know I'm making a difference. Kevin, thank you so much for being willing to jump on our podcast today, talking about all the amazing things that Central Square Technology is bringing in the tech world to our dispatch and first responders. And like always being willing to share your story and kind of be vulnerable in those senses. So I really appreciate you coming out today. Yes, no problem. And thank you, Ashley, for this um, forum. Um, this is great. I think this helps us all as an, an industry and help working with each other. So thank you for what you're doing out there. Awesome. Thank you. All right, everybody. That was another amazing episode of Let's Talk Dispatch with Central Square Technologies. Again, I love technology and I know dispatchers and first responders in general get a little weird when it comes to tech um, or anything that is just new but let's be willing to try the things, see if they work for our centers, because it might not, every technology might not fit your center and the communities you serve, but giving them a try, seeing how you work them into the, your situations and how we can use this technology to ultimately save lives or create an inclusive 911 scenario, we wanna do that. Thank you all so much, Central Square Technologies. Thank you for coming out onto the show today. Again, we'll include everything in the description of this episode. 
to easily find them and check out their technology. Until next time, everybody, stay raspy. Thank you for listening to Let's Talk Dispatch Podcast. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. You can find us wherever you listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. If you're interested in becoming a guest on the show, or maybe even submitting your own story, you can do all that and more at theraspydispatcher.com. Until next time, stay raspy.